Okay, well, welcome. So um, this is, as Jill said, the third in a series of what to expect from the 2021 census. Um, in part, I think we've been driven to do the to provide this course because of the delay in release dates, but those are becoming firmer now. Um, the first data has already come out and we have um, some sense of a timeline of what is to come. So uh, this this version of the workshop of the webinar is much more up to date than the first one where we weren't really certain what was going to be happening. Um, so um, what I'm going to take you through is uh, basically the plans for release from ONS, uh, some of the things to consider about census data. So it, you know, one of the big debating points, I think, in the session so far has been the impact of COVID on what we've collected. And, and clearly that will probably um, be an issue for, for most of the people looking at it. And then finally, to look at what we are offering around the census, so the kind of products, training and materials that we'll be making available as part of our activities. So, first of all, it's a phased release. So the first phase, um, we've already had population estimates by age and sex at local authority level uh, to come in the autumn and winter a series of topic summaries and area profiles. Uh, somebody, somebody's asked if we'd be able to access this recording. That we will, yes. Um, the recording will be made available after the event. Um, I should also say that um, we had some frequently asked questions, which I'm not sure whether they're on our website yet, but they will be from the first two of these workshops. So we kind of summarise response to them. So I was just saying, we, we've already had the population estimates by age and five year, five year age band and sex at local authority level. Um, the topic summaries and area profiles will come in autumn and winter. So um, it's still a little unclear, but the topic summaries will be univariate tables um, down to output area level, the smallest level of geography for individual um, variables. But at some stage after that, not maybe not immediately, but fairly soon, they will begin to produce the type of tables we saw um, in the 2011 census. That's uh, common tabulations between two or three variables. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two, we move on to the more flexible approach to uh, data. So this will include some of the tables that have already been defined, but will also include a new tool from ONS, a flexible table builder. And the aim of this is that you can um, decide what you want to tabulate, and it will go through a process of making sure that that data is safe to disclose. And if it is, it will be um, displayed for you to use, um, which is very different to what happened last time, when I think a number of authorities and organizations uh, were, ha were having to request commission tables to address their data needs. So, I mean, we'll see how the statistical disclosure control within the table builder works and whether it meets um, people's needs. But it does seem likely that this will significantly reduce the demand for separate commission tables. Um, also, they brought forward the small populations for short term residents um, in those tables into phase two. So phase two is kind of, um, they're saying winter to spring, um, winter 22 to spring 23. And then finally phase three has the alternative population bases, small populations, flow data and micro data. So we'll go through those a little bit more now. Um, if there are any questions, then put them in the Q&A as we go along and I'll try and pick them up as we move them through. So the order of um, release the data uh, is still around every two to three weeks. So the first set are things like demography and migration. Um, so this will give more details about uh, the people, population, demographic questions. Um, and then ethnic group, a cluster of ethnic group, national identity, language and religion. Um, they've brought forward the UK Armed Forces Veterans. Uh, release date for phase three, Ricky, is they're saying from spring 2023. 
then the set of questions on health, disability and unpaid care, housing, labour market and travel to work, um, sexual orientation and gender identity, education. OK, so those are the plans for phase one. OK, Gary's asked about mapping. Now, um, there is a slide on junk fee in a minute, so I think I'll probably answer that question on the next slide. Um, but the data will be available at all of those um, geographical levels that we commonly use. So the administrative electoral and um, statistical geographies um, from July. So the, the kind of latest we understand is that in July, the new output areas will be released, the lower super output areas in August and the mid-level super output areas in September 22. Um, that the administrative and electoral data, so you asked specifically about wards, will be released. And what will be released is the latest. So the kind of local authority structure, the ward structure, will reflect what is current at the time of the release. Um, so that data will be available through UKBS, through the um, boundary selector in um, as it's released from ONS, more or less, or there is also a, an ONS portal, which um, we need to uh, provide the links to at some stage, but they have redone their geography portal um, with some training materials. So there'll be two places where you can get that boundary data. So you will be able to map as soon as those tables are released, which looks like sometime in October. So just to go over output area geography, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it was introduced in 2001 to try and um, overcome the problem of significant boundary changes, particularly between administrative areas. So um, every, every periodically, um, ward boundaries are redesigned, uh, local authority boundaries may be redesigned, but for smaller geographies, um, the kind of designation before 2001 might have been the enumeration district, which was a collection district for the census data. So in 2001, we introduced a statistical based geography um, with a kind of target size, um, and a minimum and maximum size in terms of households and residents. Um, there was quite a lot of work done to make those areas more homogenous to try and make sense of them so that the characteristics of people living in them were more similar. Um, and as that's been revised for each of the censuses, the aim has been to try to minimise changes. So my understanding from the latest from RNS is that there will be a maximum of 5% of change to those output areas. Now, what will happen with those output areas is then, then be built in the following month up into lo lower level super output areas and then mid-level super output areas um, and you can see the boundaries of those all of those boundaries will be constrained within local authorities and again in terms of lsoas and msoas the kind of statement from ons is these are like to change as significantly as the output areas so they're promising kind of relative stability um, moving on to area profiles um, these are the sets of data that will be put together. So in terms of the population, um, we've got sex, age, legal partnership status, type of residence, where people were born, how long people have lived in the UK, and household composition. So those are the sets of tables that will come in that first wave. In terms of identity, I think I spelled them all out, but it will be ethnicity, national identity, religion and language. Um, looking at housing, it will be the size of household, tenure, whether a car is available or a van, accommodation type and central heating. Um, in terms of work, it will be around economic activity, hours worked, industry and occupation, education, you can see that full-time education or high, and highest qualification level. And in terms of health, they're covering health, um, whether people have a long-term health problem or disability, and whether they provide unpaid care. Um, I haven't included the veterans box, I think because when I wrote this, it was bottom of the list and I hadn't read much about it. So apologies for that omission. Okay, there's a question there from Ricky. Um, can I come back to that one? Remind me if I don't come back 
on travel behaviour um, at the output area level. It should be there, um, but I think we have some questions to ask about that. So, okay, underlying data. Well, but basically what you're getting, Tricia, is the underlying data. So these tables will be the core data um, that's coming through. Um, so when you get um, breakdowns of sex, age, country of birth, religion, whatever, they will all be available. Um, you won't be getting tabulated tab tables. Um, Eduardo, yeah, as far as we know, all variables will be available down to output area level. Um, I think when we come to talk about the small populations, we maybe see some examples of where that might not be true. Um, but on the general variables with the categories, yes. Okay, Tricia, so a tenure by age, for example, um, I think the, the tenure will be released first of all, and at some point, they're saying a few weeks afterwards, will be cross-tabulated with the other variables. So you can't guarantee, take the date of housing and say, I can look at tenure by age then, but it will be, you know, in a block of stuff that we get gets released after that. I don't, uh, I'm thinking about digital ability and digital resources. I don't think so. I mean, I think there will be an indicator saying whether somebody completed um, the form electronically, but I'm not certain that there's, I don't, there isn't any question about how competent are you with digital data. Um, so phase two, is looking at the short-term population. So that's anybody who's said they're intending to stay in the UK less than 12 months. Um, uh, there will also be defined set of tables. Now, these are available on our website. Um, I'll make sure afterwards that they're available linked to this event, page, this event as well. But there is a, a set of table definitions that we've received um, that are based on what was released in 2011 that will be available at some stage um, through the standard ONS interface. We talked a little bit about the flexible table builder. And I think one of the, um, this is a bit of wait and see. I suppose for me, my kind of particular research interests are around race. So I like to see full breakdowns of ethnic categories as far as possible. And one of the decisions made in the flexible table builder is that that, alongside a number of other characteristics, have been reduced to a smaller number of categories. So you'll be familiar with the way that variables are, you have lots of detailed categories and then you get a, a subset of those and a subset of those. That is kind of documented by ONS and the flexible table builder has made some decisions about reducing those categories. Um, I think that's been true of tables in the past um, as well. So it's, it's nothing new, but uh, it might affect some of us who are thinking about using the flexible table builder. So another one asking about Wi-Fi access at home. No, there isn't any, that kind of detail is held in more detailed surveys. I think there's a trade-off with the census um, to collect characteristics across the whole population as far as possible. Um, with the kind of detailed questions that would be asked. So the variable categories will be, will vary between that univariate and multivariate tables based on statistical disclosure control. So there might be a need to balance geographical scale that you're interested in um, and the level of detail that you have available. If it doesn't put something in the Q&A. Um, so within the slide presentation that you'll get, there are links. I'm not going to um, go, I will kind of just skip through them, but the alternative population basis, and this might answer the question that came up earlier, is um, that we have the short-term resident population, which has been brought forward, but the workplace population. Now there is a kind of set of calculations that create workplace zones. So that will, um, take place and then we will get details on workplace populations. So the, the question about where people were working um, or where they were during the workday or the term time addresses for um, students should be answered once, once that data is released. So I don't know if, you, Jill, sorry, did that happen when I use that link? 
Um, it's not opened up. I can still just see your sides. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Um, sorry, I'll just dive into them, but these hyperlinks will work. So in terms of small populations, again, this was um, links to the previous question about statistical disclosure control. Um, so what they've agreed to do, ONS have agreed to do, is to provide detailed tables of the writing answers at, on at least four questions. So one is on ethnic group, uh, one is on country of birth, one is on religion, and one is on national identity. So they will tabulate um, complete data at whatever geographical level is reasonable. So in 2011 and 2001, you could see um, ethnic group by output area. Um, they've also made a number of commitments about uh, particular areas that uh, categories that they will look at, including Cornish, Jain, Kashmiri, and Nepali, Nepalese, etc. Um, so those are the small population data. So those might answer some of your questions about um, where particularly populations that don't figure in the higher level categories are, but also may be subject to some disclosure control because of the small numbers relatively in different places. Um, they're talking about detailed migration data. Um, I'm not really sure what this will look like, but it's a whole set of tables about migration, which I think mirror what was there before. And then the last two are um, flow data, which is um, origin, origin destination data and microdata. Okay, thanks, Marshall, for putting the link up. I think we have links up to the census questionnaires. We're just revising our web pages to get ready for the release of census 2021 data. So hopefully they'll be a lot clearer as well. Um, so David, you've asked about um, phase two data. So um, I think if we were to think about UK data, we have to think of it as at least phase four because the Scottish data won't be available um, until at least the middle of 2023. Um, there is kind of discussions going on about how uh, we might work with ONS to produce UK-wide data sets, both for the aggregate tables and for the microdata. And part of that work um, will be, um, um, sorry, part of that work on bringing those together will be providing guidance on what makes sense to match between the two. So hopefully, Ricky, I've answered your question to some extent on travel behavior. I think Emma's come back with a similar question. I mean, I'm not really clear what will happen about working from home or office. And I think that's one of the open questions about what will happen in the census. So what did people respond to when they said, where was your workplace? And was that different for those who were furloughed, which was um, a kind of thing at that point. And that, that's one of the challenges I think for us to work through the implications of COVID and what ONS have promised to do, which I'll, I'll say a bit later on as, again, is to, um, to provide some guidance on what they think the impacts of COVID have been. Okay, um, Eduardo, can I come back to that point? So remind me later on about um, the issues about coverage and estimation processes. Um, so flow data is um, covers a number of things, but it covers migration flow, it covers workplace flow, second address flow, and student flow. And as I say, this is one of the areas that might be um, challenging to interpret. As I understand it, students were um, advised to put in their term time address. The extent to which they will have done that, um, we might be able to see from the data, or it might have been cleaned up to reflect that. Um, but for other groups, it really isn't very clear to me what will happen. It feels like people moving around mobility generally was significantly affected by the pandemic, but in what ways that's reflected in the data is a kind of, let's have a look and see what we can understand from it. Um, the micro data is, so samples of individual records, um, at the regional level, there's around 120 variables. Um, so there's 5% samples of regional 
and combined local authority geographies. Uh, so the combined local authorities are just smaller local authorities where two are pushed together, generally. There's a 1% household sample, and there's a 1% individual sample that's sent to the University of Minnesota, uh, which is an international census microdatabase. So those data are all safeguarded, so you would need to be um, registered with the UK Data Service and to access that through us. Um, and in the secure data, we have an individual 10% sample and a household 10% sample and those are accessed through the secure facilities of either ONS or the UK data service. Some considerations then. Oh, I've talked a bit about COVID as we've gone along but um, we're working through that and it would be good to see the tables to see what impact it has on the so that we can refine our guidance. As I understand it, ONS when they release data will be providing some consideration there is already something in the first release data, but they've uh, agreed to provide more details about how it affects particular data releases. Um, you know, thinking about it, particularly around employment, place of residence, people may have changed, work and education. Um, so I, I think this is going to be a significant uh, area of focus for many researchers. I think ONS acknowledge that and hopefully the materials they provide will help us navigate through what the impact is. Um, alongside this, they've also made commitments on the population demography side to improve the data that's released so that they can take 2021 as a baseline but move on quite quickly to more robust estimates of population because um, as some of you will be aware, there has been um, differential impacts on the resident population, which could have resource implications, which are raising concerns in some aspects, some parts of local public services. Um, the second thing to do is to look at the quality assurance process. So one of the um, differences with this process this time was that ONS offered to talk to local authorities about the information, the basic demographic information they had, and that is part of the reason I think the process was extended, but also does highlight a number of issues that may be relevant to you. So in conversation with them, I think students came up, the student population came up as quite a significant issue for a number of authorities. If you have a significant student population in the area you're interested in and your research area, it would be worth kind of picking up on that. And there will be other issues in that quality assurance process. Um, on coverage and statistical implementation, hopefully, Eduardo, this will help to answer your questions. Um, but at the moment, we have coverage estimates for uh, local authorities. So if you go into the ONS website, um, and I'm not sure whether we're going to be able to pull this through or not, there's some um, investigation on that at the moment, you can see the coverage at local authority website, um, local authority level. So you can see the actual count, um, the mid-year population estimate for the year before, and the estimate of coverage, which is then used to impute the population figures that are published. So just to go over that very quickly again, what happens in census geography is that despite the fact there's, you know, between 80, 87 and 97 percent of the population complete this by local authority areas, there still is a statistical process to bring that up to full population estimates. Um, and that process is described in ONS documentation and the figures for it are available on the current releases of local authority level. Now, the question you ask, Eduardo, is will that be applied to these small populations? Um, I think that's probably something to see with the documentation that comes out with them. I wouldn't want to guarantee it, but I would kind of expect it to be there um, because there is a whole kind of case about equity and who's not reporting that needs to be considered in census data. So in 2011, we had significant undercounts of um, gypsies and travelers, for example, in previous censuses, we've had different types of undercounts. So I think that would be an important part of the um, quality process um, to look at small population groups and whether they 
have reported it different ways when there's differential bias in effect. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, come back if, it, if there's something else. Yeah, I think I think it, this is a challenge for local authorities. This is a challenge, um, I think, for researchers as well. And and, um, and and the timing makes it even more complex in some ways, uh, in that people may have gone somewhere else for their lockdown. Um, so the, whether this was a temporary or permanent phenomenon. Um, so I think this is a, a big issue that lots of people will probably do methodological work on as well as having to account for it in their own research. Um, I think I mean, we mentioned the geography, changing geography a bit here. Um, I think this is, you know, potentially significant. So if we think of a place, so I did my kind of a set of research on Greater Manchester, and I was looking at LSOA geography um, in that period between 2001 and 2011. And this is just an example, but some of the things that were going on were massive redevelopments of new properties on brownfield sites. So the emergence of lots of new LSOAs, potentially out of one kind of big one that might have covered some residential property. Similarly, there was clearances and changes to population groups that led to other splinter factions. Um, I think what might be more challenging this time repeating that exercise in Greater Manchester is that there's been a lot more infill and that infill is not necessarily um, as similar to places around it. So around Manchester University where I work there has been lots of infill but that um, housing development a largely gated community student populations etc. So there will be some challenges in interpreting that but it shouldn't be too massive and it will be very specifically place-based. Um, last time, uh, 2011, ONS provided details of what has shifted where, um, so you could kind of model um, population change at that level. Okay, so, um, and general trust not willingness to disclose some characteristics. So I think this is kind of, I just referred to it earlier with gypsies and travelers, but I mean, I think there was a pretty hostile um, approach from the coalition government towards gypsies and travelers. Um, and linked to that, I think there was a real unwillingness. So the number of people who counted themselves as gypsy and travelers was around 50,000 in the 2011 census, whilst the number estimated from other sources was around 300,000. So that's like you know the great majority of people choosing not to disclose some of those characteristics um some of the new characteristics around sexuality and gender identity are voluntary anyway so there is a, a kind of choice the others aren't meant to be voluntary but i think there may well be categories where we don't see some of the data we would like to see so let's just pick up the questions here um okay statistical disclosure control well we will be doing something about that later but my understanding is that as with 2011 there will be swapping of small cell counts at whatever geography you're looking at um, and that that will add a bit of random noise as you describe it but then the statistical disclosure control itself will determine whether the data is releasable i.e whether it whether it um, poses disclosure risks. Um, that will be do documented more fully, but it is going to be a rules-based disclosure control, so it will be fairly easy to understand what it's doing. Um, Trish, on internal migration, it may well throw some light on it, but what it, unfortunately what the census does is give us a snapshot, so we can't see the point at which bounce back occurs. Um, so I think there's a um, a challenge looking at administrative systems to see how those work in relation to um, the kind of population shifts. Um, so Sarah's asked about sexuality and gender identity. They've been released as a separate characteristic. So they come slightly lower down the list. Um, 
but they will be released as, as separate characteristics. So the last part is really talking about what we're going to offer. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm the lead on, on training for census data. And I suppose I've been trying to think about um, things we might do um, that would have been useful to me at the point at which I use them um, in the past. Um, so it would be good if people have ideas to feed them into us because um, at the moment we have a relatively blank sheet. We know that there are certain needs that everybody will have, but we would like to move beyond kind of training from our individual um, parts of the organization. So, so um, we, we will have a new interface for the aggregate data. So at the moment you might have used varieties of Infuse, um, Decan, um, and Casweb, which are odd names. I think there will be a, a more straightforward, more modern interface to aggregate data. Um, the geographical data from the UK Data Service will look much the same. Um, and those two are likely to be available from other sources as well. So we know that ONS will be providing aggregate data this time rather than putting it out through NOMIS. And we know they'll also be providing geographical data, the boundaries. Um, and, and it's a choice for you which one you want. I think there are some uh, additional features in the UK data service, but clearly there will be more of a delay in, in getting those because we would have to take them when they're released by ONS and prepare them and get them ready to use. Um, the flow data and microdata are generally safeguarded data, so are only available from the UK data service. Um, so in terms of the data, the, the kind of stuff that's coming out from now onwards through the autumn and winter, you'll be able to get from us and from other people. When we move into next year with the more detailed things around flow data and microdata, then you'll probably be dependent on us or the secure service, depending on uh, which level of secure access you want. Can we come back to that, Gary, in a few minutes at the end? Um, I'll try and pick up what we're trying to do around that area as well. Um, so we recognize we have different audiences and those needs are somewhat different. So clearly our a core audience for us, as we're funded by the ESRC, is the academic world. And thinking about this, it's also, it's not only about research, but it's also about those people teaching and how we equip our students with kind of what is relatively up-to-date information um, about the UK. Um, we're kind of public sector bodies, so both national departments, local health councils, um, et cetera, have been regular attenders. Um, students in HE, FE and schools may well come to us independently and the voluntary and community sector. Um, so in terms of thinking what we're offering, part of it is making ourselves attractive, particularly to those who don't necessarily see us as a place um, they would go to. So the kind of training we're offering will be around awareness raising. That's like this session, um, some how to sessions on the kind of major types of data um, and some techniques and substantive areas of interest. Um, so, for example, um, we've done some work on educational inequality um, using census microdata. Um, we might think about ecological analysis, which is analysis of characteristics of places and how those predict things we might see. Um, and um, an important one, I think, for voluntary and public sector is developing a local area profile. So how might you put things together to understand the place that you're operating in? and perhaps the neighborhoods within it. We'll also be training on kind of contextual background. So um, on the implications of COVID-19, coverage and imputation, the modifiable, modifiable aerial unit problem and statistical disclosure control. And I think in those particularly, we will be looking to work with ONS to make sure what we're saying is informed exactly by what they understand and they may well come along and take part with us in that. Um, okay, so, and we have been running 
um, the next one's tomorrow. Um, smaller groups aimed at targeted audiences to think about planning and designing research using census 2021 data. So subject to demand, we will advertise another workshop in September 2022. Um, I think the other thing to say is we're also thinking about a census conference in 2023 to bring together um, people's experiences of working with it and some early findings. Um, so to some extent that might answer um, Jerry's question. The other thing that might answer it is that we are kind of trying to keep our materials up to date. So we're currently rewriting um, uh, materials on um, the, we'll be updating release schedules. We'll be putting some video, video materials explain us the key census variables and we have our help desk as well which can also provide support so those are the kind of ways we're thinking about it um so first of all we do have an email helpline gary but hopefully we're going to be a bit doing a bit more and providing proactive um information um that will help you so those explainers in particular think about what's changed um with maybe the definition, the categories, et cetera, in key census variables. So um, those will be released in the autumn, probably to time with what's going on. So I suppose the answer is, is watch this space, but hopefully we will be geared up and we'll have interesting materials.